The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The 23rd Psalm is probably the most popular of the Psalms in the Old Testament. It is typically associated with funeral liturgies and is often quoted during wedding ceremonies. The Eastern Orthodox Church typically includes this psalm in their Eucharist service. Traditionally, in the Jewish faith, the 23rd Psalm is sung during the third Sabbath meal. Why such popularity? The imagery of the 23rd Psalm is touching and heartwarming. God being portrayed as a loving and caring shepherd leading and feeding his flock. Could this Psalm be more than the poetic writings of King David? With hindsight, we see Jesus in the imagery of this psalm. When King David penned these words, Jesus had not yet come. Is it possible that our beloved 23rd Psalm is a messianic prophecy predicting the life and ministry of Jesus Christ? Let's see. In episode two, we will expand on the messianic nature of Psalm 23. Jesus is our great shepherd who anoints our head with oil and causes our cup to run over with the Holy Spirit. No doubt, this verse alludes to the seasonable hospitality Brazil Lehi, the Gileite, gave to David during his flight from Absalom. Such was the table prepared for David in the presence of his enemies. Did King David prophesy that the Messiah would banquet in the presence of his enemies and that an anointing would occur? The answer is yes. The Pharisees were the enemies of Jesus, and on at least two occasions he sat with them at dinner. The plotting and scheming of the Pharisees was shrouded in a pseudo-hospitality. Jesus clearly dined in the presence of his enemies. We also see the feet of Jesus anointed with expensive perfume on three occasions. On one occasion, Jesus chided his Pharisee host for not performing the customary duties of a host. 
by not providing water for the washing of his feet, a hospitality kiss of greeting, and the anointing of the head with oil. A woman, probably a prostitute, gained access to the banquet. How did she get into the house? Was she a common guest at this house? She fell at Jesus' feet, weeping. Her tears washed the feet of Jesus, and she anointed them with oil. Again, in the houses of Simon the leper and Lazarus, the head and feet of Jesus were anointed with expensive perfume. The disciples, especially Judas Iscariot, reproached the woman for such a waste of an expensive perfume. But Jesus rebuked Judas and thanked the woman for her service. Jesus told his audience that these women were preparing him for his burial. Did King David prophetically witness these events? I think the answer is yes. Could Psalm 23 have a deeper metaphorical application? Let's see. When we read about the anointing of the head, we think of kings and priests being anointed for service. But David viewed this ministry from a different point of view. Shepherds understood David's metaphor because good shepherds would anoint the heads of his sheep to protect them from lice and other insects that would burrow into the sheep's ears and kill them. To David, the anointing of the head would be a ministry of healing a shepherd would perform on his sheep. David prophesied that the Messiah would anoint the heads of his sheep, and we see this action in the ministry of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus understood that the Spirit of the Lord would anoint the Messiah to preach the gospel. Let's read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus also commissioned the twelve disciples to travel throughout Israel preaching the gospel and anointing the sick with oil as acts of healing. And they went out and preached that men should repent. And they cast out many devils, and anointed with oil many that were sick, and healed them. At this point, the twelve tapped into the messianic calling to anoint the sheep of Israel. James, the brother of Jesus, also used this same tactic when he said, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up, and if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. The anointing of the head is a ministry of healing. Consider this thought. Is the messianic anointing 
of the head, also an act of sealing and consecration. What impact would the Messianic anointing have on our lives? When we are anointed by Jesus, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is the same as the sealing of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul answered this question. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? He also wrote, In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. The Greek word for sealing is suffragizo, which means to stamp with a signet ring or private mark for security or preservation. We have been sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. According to the Apostle John, this anointing will abide in us and teach us all things. But the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. King David now uses a figure of speech that is not common to a shepherd. He uses the symbol of a cup to describe the refreshing that will come from the Messiah. What could a cup represent to King David? David used a cup as a symbol of his inheritance in the Lord and the salvation that comes to all who will call upon the name of the Lord. Consider this thought. Is the cup symbolic of our soul? I think the answer is yes. David seems to indicate that our cup will be filled with salvation, and we celebrate this reality in our communion service when we drink wine, symbolic of the blood of Christ. David envisioned the divine shepherd of God giving his sheep cups overflowing with his divine provision. Again, we return to the last and greatest day of the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, where Jesus told the crowd that those who believe in him would have living water flowing in their souls. He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. Out of our innermost being, our soul shall flow rivers of living water? Clearly, this speaks of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The overflowing cup that we receive from our Messianic Shepherd is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the New Testament, the cup is also symbolic of another thing. Could the cup be a symbol for the will of God? I think the answer is yes. Jesus 
alludes to this fact that the cup he had to drink was the will of his father. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into thy sheath. The cup which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? So often, we think this verse speaks of Calvary and the cross. But Calvary is only one aspect of the will of God for Jesus. The cup that Jesus drank from only culminated in the horrors of the cross. Jesus was drinking the cup of God's will from the time he was a babe crying in his mother's arms. Jesus drank from the cup when he was baptized and compelled by the Holy Spirit to be tempted in the desert for 40 days. He drank his Father's cup when he preached the gospel and healed the sick. He even drank from the cup when he was crucified, and Jesus also drank from the cup when he rose from the dead. The overflowing cup that Jesus gives to his sheep is the will of God. A dispute broke out among Jesus' disciples as to who would sit on the right and left of Jesus in the kingdom of God. Jesus chided his disciples when he said, But Jesus answered and said, You know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink of? and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They say unto him, We are able. And he said unto them, Ye shall drink indeed of my cup, and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it was prepared of my Father. Can we drink from the same cup that Jesus drank from? Can we be baptized with the same baptism that Jesus experienced? The cup of God's will is available for all to drink from. The will of God did compel the disciples to be baptized with the Holy Spirit and to be obedient even unto the point of death, even the death of the cross. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Can we drink from the overflowing cup provided by the Lord? Only time will tell. Goodness and mercy shall follow the Lord Shepherd all the days of his life. Our Shepherd will bestow goodness and mercy on his flock. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them, as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered, on a day of clouds and darkness. The Messiah will be a shepherd of mercy. Do we see Jesus being a shepherd of mercy? Yes, we do. The Sermon on the Mount can be summed up 
by the declaration that the merciful shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Mercy is not religious display. Jesus made that clear when he quoted from the prophecy of Hosea. But if you had known what this means, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For I desire mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Religion has a value, but God desires more than empty religious display. The attitude of mercy is birthed out of a heart of love. Mercy is compassion or forgiveness shown towards someone who is within one's power to punish or harm. The heart of God is the heart of a shepherd who bestows mercy on all who call on him. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Jude makes a connection between the love of God and the mercy found in Christ. Eternal life also follows the path of mercy. King David might have envisioned a future temple that his son Solomon would build when he said, that we would dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But could this truth be describing much more? Could it have eternal meaning? In the Old Testament, the house of God or the house of the Lord was the wilderness tabernacle or the first and second temples of Jerusalem. But is this the house of the Lord of Psalm 23? Psalm 23 was written as a song of praise for the tabernacle of David. To David, this was the house of the Lord. The thing that makes the tabernacle of David so important was the presence of the Ark of the Covenant. To the Israelite nation, the ark symbolized the presence of God and the location where God would communicate with them. And there I will meet with thee, and I will commune with thee from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubims, which are upon the ark of the testimony of all things which I have given thee in commandment unto the children of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant, with the mercy seat and cherubim, was the place of meeting with God. Between the wings of the cherubim, the holy manifest presence of God would interact with the children of Israel. The Ark of the Covenant was much more than a symbol of God's presence to Israel. It was God's presence. During the wilderness wandering, the ark was at rest when it was in the most holy place of the wilderness tabernacle constructed by Moses. Once a year, during Passover, the high priest would enter the most holy place with lamb's blood to offer a blood covering for the sins of Israel. During seasons of travel or conquest, the ark was carried on the shoulders of the Levitical priests. This was the divine order established by God for the transportation of the ark. 
when the feet of the priests carrying the ark touched the Jordan River. The waters parted, and the nation of Israel passed over on dry ground. The ark was carried around the city of Jericho at the time of its downfall. The ark was reunited with the tabernacle of Moses at Shiloh. The ark remained at Shiloh until the time of Eli the high priest, when it was carried along with the army in the hopes that it would secure victory for the Israelites against the Philistines. The Philistines were not only victorious, but also captured the ark. But they gladly returned it after seven months of captivity. The ark was taken to Kirith Jerem, where it remained until the time of David. Its removal to Jerusalem was delayed three months by the death of Uzzah, who carelessly touched it. During its three-month delay, the ark remained in the house of Obedium. After three months, the ark was finally taken, with great rejoicing, to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. When David became king, he was burdened with the desire to bring the ark home to Jerusalem. Therefore, he commissioned a new ox cart to transport it. This action was disastrous, resulting in the death of Yuza, his dear friend, who was only attempting to stabilize the ark when the oxen stumbled. David was stunned by this occurrence. Why would God allow his best friend to die when engaging in such a noble mission? King David allowed the ark to remain at the house of Obedium for nearly three months because he needed an answer. We do not truly know what David did after this occurrence because the Bible goes silent. We can only speculate about this silent period from the next historic movement of the ark. Let me list a few speculative thoughts. David must have sought God in prayer during his pain and personal grief. He must have realized that God stopped his plan. Therefore, he needed God to provide a proper plan. David probably ordered the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, read to him. And during this narration, he learned of the wilderness tabernacle and the Levitical order of worship and ministry. The ark must be carried by the Levites, not oxen carts. God responded by allowing David a revelation of his divine order of ministry and worship. The result of David's three-month hiatus was the order and construction of the Tabernacle of David on Mount Zion. Why didn't David return the ark to the Tabernacle of Moses? At this time in scriptural history, the Tabernacle of Moses was erected at the Canaanite city of Gabon six miles north of Jerusalem. The answer to this question will be provided when we discuss the book of Revelation. To David, the house of the Lord could not be the future temples of Israel. The house of the Lord must be the tabernacle he built on Zion. How does this description of the house of the Lord link with Jesus and the Messiah. Again, we will discuss this application when we explore the book of Revelation.
David sought to build God a permanent temple that would house the Ark of the Covenant. But God rejected his request because he was a man of blood and war. God instructed David that his son Solomon would build the temple because he would be a man of peace. Solomon did build the temple promised to his father David, and he patterned it after the tabernacle of Moses. The ark was moved to the temple during dedication, and the glory of the Lord filled the house of God to the point that the priests could not stand. At this time, the house of the Lord was the temple of Solomon. Sadly, the temple of Solomon was destroyed in 586 BC when Jerusalem was conquered and taken into captivity in Babylon. The second temple began to be restored by Ezra and Nehemiah around 516 BC and was completed during the reign of King Herod the Great. What became of this temple? It was destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD. The New Testament teaches that God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but He dwells in the hearts of His faithful. We, those born of the Holy Spirit, form the temple of God. In the Old Testament, the house of the Lord can be seen in two tabernacles, Moses and David, and the two temples of Solomon and Zerubbabel. In the New Testament, we see the house of the Lord in Jesus Christ and the body of Christ, spiritual fulfillment of the houses seen in the Old Testament. What a promise! We will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let this truth find rest in your soul. I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. The 23rd Psalm is a prophetic description of the Messianic Good Shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. All the power of this Psalm emanates from Calvary. Without the cross, there would be no life and ministry. We would not know the anointing of the Holy Spirit, nor would we live in the house of the Lord forever. Everything passes through the cross.